Well, we do have a wonderful uh, topic to continue to study tonight, and um, you'll see, hopefully you'll see why I chose this, this passage for a reading. Be, because we're still talking about the will of God, there's kind of one of any hundreds of passages that we could talk about because the whole Bible shows and declares to us um, the will of God. And that's a wonderful thing for us to, to know and understand. <clears throat> but as we start, or as we begin our study tonight, I, uh, in, in our continuing study in Confidence in Christ, we know this is our second study on MYOB. Did anybody ever use this acronym growing up with your kids? Or when you were kids? It was a big, no, you never did? Oh my goodness. It was a very, very important acronym because someone would come up and either want to share some gossip or, or butt into your conversation and you had to say, Karen, M-Y-O-B. And M-Y-O-B means mind your own business, right? It was a very important acronym. We all need to learn the wonderful acronym M-Y-O-B or mind your own business. We can't... Uh, really could not have survived this long as a species without the wonderful, or with the idea rather, that everyone just needs to go about and mind their own business as much as is possible uh, and as much as relies on us. We find that many, however, can't mind their own business because they think that everything's their business. Um, they have as what I essentially would call a God complex. They're convinced that everyone, everything, everyone, everyone's choices, everyone's decisions, everyone's lives, how they live it and otherwise, that's their business, and so they should get to weigh in, right? So it's really impossible to mind our own business if we're pretty much convinced that we're God. And that's really at the center of most of our sin issues, right? Is that the very center of our, of, our, of our sin issues tends to be the fact that we think or we want to be God. Wasn't that the serpent's very original uh, temptation of Adam and Eve? That you shall be as what? As gods. You'll be like God. And we've been kind of working towards that every single day since. So one of the reasons that we struggle at times to mind our own business is because we, we think that everything is our own business. So that means we need to have a pretty sober view of what is and what isn't our business, okay? That's, that's why we're doing this study, to try to figure out where does my business stop and someone else's business start so I can mind my own. Next. Many can't mind their own business because they don't like their business, right? There's a lot of people who become uh, frustrated, become busybodies, become obsessed with other people's doings because they're just not really satisfied with what's going on in their own life, right? That's a sad place to be, but it's certainly something that isn't, uh, isn't ideal. So uh, a lot of people are trying to, and I, I put can't, I should have put don't, but a lot of people don't mind their business because it's their business is unpleasant or their business is uncomfortable or there's something about it that they don't like. There's something in their business, their lives, that they don't want to face and they don't want to deal with, right? And as Christians, these aren't just non-Christians, by the way. In fact, I would say that Christians can ex uh, exude this or live this way as much as anybody can. So um, minding our own business or not minding our business because we just don't like our business means that we're making some poor choices, right? Because there's something that we're running away from in our business. There's something that we either feel insecure about, something that we just, we'd, we'd rather not deal with, so we go try to mind someone else's. Next, many can't mind their own business because they think that if they interfere, interfere with others, no one will notice their hypocrisy. And this is about as serious as it gets. Jesus Christ himself was most hard on those who were hypocritical. Those who were sinners, those who were um, prostitutes and drunks, they had a place in his presence. But hypocrites and liars, it was a tough, tough to be around Jesus, particularly the worst kind of hypocrite. We're all uh, hypocrites to some degree, right? But the worst kind of hypocrite is a religious hypocrite. We the Lord abhors religious hypocrisy because there's that kind of sense of, of if I can draw the attention onto someone else and their sins or someone else and their issues, then I won't, then no one will notice. Or maybe, interestingly, with some 
bizarre theories of moral balancing that by pointing out those people's problems that mine will somehow fade away. We see this uh, tragically in some of our, our greatest politicians, world leaders, or, or even uh, f- uh, c- celebrities, right? They're going out and they're doing great things and you think, oh my goodness, isn't it wonderful that they're helping out that community or helping out this do with this situation or whatever and then all of a sudden the news breaks and whatever it is that horrible scandal that they're into shows you that all of that good workism and all those good works that they were doing were really just morally trying to placate the fact that they were disgustingly astray inside right so they can't mind their business because they think if they interfere with others no one will notice their hypocrisy right finally uh For tonight, many can't mind their own business because they are so insecure about what they're doing that they think that forcing you to do it too will assure them that they aren't wrong, right? Everybody's got to be in. Everyone has to think the way I think. Everything, everyone has to do what I do. There's no room for disagreement. Why? Well, because I'm really deeply insecure about what I believe. If you're secure about what you believe, then... um, (laughs) <laughs> then you're not threatened by someone who has an alternate opinion. You might hope to help them, hope them to see things were right, but if someone were to, you know, race in here right now and accuse you with all vitriol and all seriousness that you are Napoleon Bonaparte, you'd laugh at them. And then you'd start to wonder if they were dangerous because the very idea that you would be of Napoleon Bonaparte is absurd, Right? And yet many people, because they're not convinced of their own ideology, have to get everybody else or their own thinking or whatever it is, have to get everyone else to do it too as a part of their insecurity. So these are just some ideas as to why people can't mind their own business. And this is, this is a very pivotal portion of our study of confidence in Christ. Because I hope what you can see out of this is that most people who can't mind their own business or don't mind their own business, they don't do it because they've got some sort of insecurity or difficulty in their relationship with Christ that needs to be dealt with. Because if we're honest, I think most of us will have an instance probably today or this week when we could have chosen to mind our own business, but instead we chose to make someone else's worries our own. Now maybe you didn't do anything about it, but my thinking is very regularly not on my own business. My thinking is very frequently on God's business. And that's why uh, this is so important because that's how you become this guy. I don't know who this guy is. He's probably an actor and a brilliant fellow, but he's portraying a Pharisee in this situation. So uh, he, he's portraying the people who gave Jesus the most difficult time on earth because they just couldn't mind their own business. It wasn't enough to look and say, what is God's will and how can I do that humbly and lovingly? And those Pharisees who did, like Nicodemus, showed their colors and, and came after Jesus and said, I want to know what you're about. What you know, ask questions of him, and Jesus made himself available to him. But many other Pharisees, right, were so busy trying to pile up bundles and loads for other people to carry, but they themselves wouldn't lift a finger to to lift them, were in Jesus's main sights. There were his main groups of criticism. And so if we're looking at our uh, God's will chart, I'm going to remind you that this is just a chart. It's not perfect. You can't find this chart etched on the pages of any ancient Greek or Hebrew manuscripts, but it is a nice way of looking at the biblical data. So we saw the uh, last week in our study, or in our previous study, we saw God's sovereign will. Okay? We talked about how God has a sovereign will that includes a great number of things. We saw that God's sovereign will included... Um, God's sovereign will included his plan for the ages, right? The nations that he he revealed to Daniel and to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, these nations are coming. That's what's happening. Nothing you do is going to change that. We saw how his sovereign will included uh, the timing of the rapture, which he keeps holy to himself, the seven years of coming judgment upon earth, the thousand-year reign of Christ. They're all a part of God's sovereign will. They're happening whether you want them to or not. And what we saw that was probably, hopefully, most encouraging is that your salvation, the minute you trusted in Jesus Christ, you became a part of God's sovereign will. He declared that you had been moved as a matter of fact by the divine sovereign will of God from death to life, and nothing can move you back. Your salvation is a part of that outer circle. 
Your identification with Christ, God decreed before, uh, before the world began that anyone who places faith in Christ would be identified in him his, with him in his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seating. And so you are by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. So as God goes about the business of running the universe, how many of us are occasionally guilty of not minding our business, but minding his. Telling him what he should do with the world leaders, world governments, world affairs. Anybody else have that sickness? I do. Instead of going to read my newspaper, as I should, and saying it with prayer, and Lord, may mo the most people get saved possible. May you be glorified even through this. Lord, I entrust this entirely to your care. I say, oh, you know what those people are. Oh, you know who we should vote in or out or up or down. Am I minding my own business? No, I'm distracted. And therefore I become insecure and I can't live with the confidence because I'm the confidence that God designed me to because I haven't recognized that's my sovereign will. I'll take care of that. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying don't uh, be uninformed. Don't be uninformed. Be informed, vote, pay attention to what's going on. If nothing else, to be mindful constantly that as much as everything seems insanely out of control, we are absolutely assured that it is 100% in control. And every moment that you spend studying prophecy and studying what God has ahead, to me, makes the newspaper reading. It's not to say that we find those prophecies fulfilled in the newspaper, but we see where the Lord easily will take his next steps. So it's a great comfort and assurance if we're able to mind our own business. So today we get to get into the next circle, which is God's moral will. And <clears throat> when we talk about God's moral will, I want to be, remind us that, again, of these wrong angles that we sometimes take when it comes to discerning or finding out what the will of God is. And the first is the good works man-made rules way. If I'm just doing all the good things, everything that I think is right, then all of a sudden everything will be fine. That's no way to know God's will, just doing what your deceptive heart says. God's will is not for us to just keep various religious observations, whether that's you know, church attendance or certain sacraments or rites, or pa rites of passage within the church. Um, next, seeking the approval of others, asking if we all just came to a consensus on what God's will was, would we be right? Well, maybe but probably not. God is not taking votes as to what his will will be. Can you believe that? Just a great, wonderful comfort. Every time we have an election in this country, and it feels like the whole world is exploding into just little shrapnel and shards of awful, it's a great thing to know that the God of the universe isn't taking votes for anything. It's a nice, nice comfort anyway. But uh, seeking the approval of others, the approval of most people think is not a way to find God's will. The golden road is not a way to find God's will. Remember, this, is, this was that picture that many of us carry of God, that God has this hidden secret best will for your life. It's a golden path etched through your life. And if you're lucky, you'll stumble upon it. As if God, and so they get these, these poor humans, and I myself have been one. God, what's your will for this situation? Tell me what you want me to do. Tell me what you want me to do. Tell me what you want me to do. As if God was some sort of cruel parent up there going, well, I know exactly what's best, but I'm not telling you. You have to find out yourself. You have to figure it out the hard way. And what we'll see is that picture of God's will is not only pretty masochistic, it's a pretty evil view of God when you really think about it. It's also wholly inconsistent with how God's will is revealed to us in the Bible uh, in every way. Finally, the peace plan. This is the idea is that if I feel peaceful about it, if I feel peace about it, it must be God's will. Now, that might be a decent indicator, but ultimately, as we look through how to know God's will or how to make decisions via the Word of God and the Spirit of God, I think we can come up with something far better than I feel very peaceful. I feel okay about this decision. Um, we can do better than that. So the, what we ultimately want to take home from this time is very simple, and that's that God's will is revealed in the Bible. You ready to commit to that premise? God's will is revealed in the Bible. That sounds s simple, and maybe that's uh, simple enough to be profound or not, but what we have to recognize is that everything that we need to know about God's will is revealed within the Bible. And so the Bible is not going to leave us questioning and wondering, hiccuping and praying after some hopeful, mystical answer. 
and make that unclear. So uh, when we come to the Bible, part of the reason why we want to read the Bible is because we want to know what God's will is in every situation. And we are, as we uh, come uh, smaller and smaller into these circles, we come uh, into a clearer and clearer picture of what God's will is for you today, tonight, tomorrow, and on into the until you're face to face with him. So <clears throat> I do want to make one more clarification. I made this uh, in the last session, but it's worth repeating. M moral, God's moral will, that can have the idea of morality. And morality is not void, devoid of, from this circle, but it's not just God's moral will as in terms of, you know, we think of an immoral act as stealing or, you know, murder or or some other horrible thing, embezzlement, or whatever it is. There's all these terrible things that a person might do, and we think of those as morals or morality. But God's moral will is actually much larger than that. It's not just what he wants. It includes that, what he wants us to do and what he does not want us to do. And we'll look at why, because that's as, as it relates to his character. Um, but God's moral will is, is greater. It's God's will for every single person. So we're going to start right at the beginning of the book to find a picture of God's moral will. It says, Then the Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So what is this? This is not God's sovereign will, is it? I mean, it's God's sovereign will of what will happen after, if they obey or disobey. But God is giving Adam and Eve a choice, is he not? He's giving them a, a choice. And this is where the, the first major distinction between God's moral will and God's sovereign will comes, is that no one will defy, break, or destroy God's sovereign will. That's going to happen regardless. That is a part of his sovereignty. He's saying, I'm going to weigh in. This is going to happen. It is going to turn out this way. Your salvation is absolutely secure. But God's moral will is something that man can, can choose to um, cooperate with, and uh, submit ourselves to or violate, right? And so here we want to note that the first example of God's moral will, that is to say abiding in and uh, keeping with his commands, is interestingly a non-moral issue, right? Eating a piece of fruit, is that moral, a moral issue? No, I wouldn't say that someone who was you know, had purchased a, a bunch of apples, and we'd say, but not that one. No, they, we'd know that eating, eating fruit is one of the things we're designed for. It's one of the things that fruit was designed for, and yet this becomes a moral issue, not because of its moral charge, but why? Because God said it. It's very important that we note the first instance of, of God's moral will that we see is a non-moral issue. It's only moral because it's what he said. From uh, any other human perspective, we'd say, well, he's taking a bite of a piece of fruit. What's the big deal? It's, it doesn't even register on the evil scale, does it? But the important thing that we learn from this very outset of, of God's will being put forth in the, freedom of, in the freedom of man existing is that God gives a choice, and the most important choice that man makes is not just expressly what he does or doesn't do. It's whether or not he's going to trust in and obey the God of the universe. That's what makes it moral. That's what makes it important to do. So here in this first picture, we already know what happens, right? But Adam and Eve choose not to obey God's will. So we know that there is an element or a way of God's will, his sovereign will, that can be broken or is open to uh, essentially freeze up human will to make choices, right? And then the humans, people, are subject to the consequences of those choices um, or receive the, yeah, receive the results of those actions. And this is the way that God seems to view and, and make everything. He says there's this sovereign part. You're not going to mess with that. You're not going to be allowed to mess with that. You're not going to touch that. But I'm going to give you these choices. Now, interestingly, God didn't even give Adam a handful of choices, at least as far as we know. He didn't say Adam and Eve... If you uh, don't fly, or if you want to, you can fly. He didn't even give them that choice. He made a system with rules. He didn't make them with wings, and so Adam and Eve would not be flying. 
He didn't give them that choice. He didn't give them the choice to become a fish or a bear or some of the other animals. He gave them no choice as to regards to that. The one choice he gave them that mattered was the choice to trust him or not. And he gave them, just as he gives every person, that choice. It was very, very important because we cannot, we don't need to take responsibility for the choices that we cannot make. We need to take responsibility for the choices that we are given to make. You may not be given a choice as to what you're going to do tomorrow. Circumstances and time and where the Lord's placed you might make that very clear. And you have no choice but to be where you're going to be tomorrow or in five years or in ten years. But the choice that God does give you is what we need to pay attention to. Genesis 4, 6, and 7 gives us another beautiful picture in narrative form of God's will. Remember, at this point, um, Cain and Abel have come before the Lord, and righteous Abel gives a sacrifice of a lamb from his flock, the firstborn, the best of his flock. He gives this lamb without spot or blemish. He sacrifices it to the Lord. And what do we see that was undoubtedly passed down from, uh, from the fall onward is that one, those sacrifices were regular and those sacrifices were meant to be blood sacrifices. But well, what did Cain do? Cain brought along the, the harvest of his land, the farm that he had brought forth from his farming. And it wasn't that God was against farmers or didn't like fresh vegetables. It was the fact that Cain came with a bloodless sacrifice. Just as Adam and Eve came with the, uh, you know, the leaves over them to cover their sin and he said no that's not enough something has to bleed and die to cover for that sin and so he sacrificed or he took lambs and made skins or made sorry it doesn't say lambs took animals and made skins for them to cover them right and so here in the Adam or the Cain and Abel situation Cain's sacrifice is not regarded by the Lord and Cain's upset by this and the Lord says something to Cain so the Lord said to Cain why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen Countenance means face, and fallen has this idea of, it's a very beautiful picture, right? When someone's frustrated or humiliated, what do they do? They look down, right? When you, when you are reproaching a child and they know they've done wrong, where do they look? They're never looking up. They're never looking you in the eye. They're always looking down. They're saying, look at me. Make eye contact. That's what God's saying. Make eye contact. Look at me. Why is your hand, why is your countenance fallen? Why is your face down? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. I'd love to take more time and go into the particulars of this verse, but it's really not in the purview of our discussion. However, what we will say is that here it says, sin lies at your door. This is a very graphic Hebrew word. It means crouches. It says sin is crouching at your door, and you need to master it. How would he master it? Well, mastering it in this case would have been going back and making the appropriate blood sacrifice before the Lord, recognizing that his best was not good enough, and then Cain would have mastered sin. But as it is, as he tries to do good on his own, sin masters him. We all know what happens. But the important thing, because Cain, uh, Cain chooses instead of um, going and making the, humbling himself and making the appropriate sacrifice before the Lord, recognizing by faith in his need for God, instead Cain makes the choice to sacrifice or murder his brother. Right? This is a point. Did God will for Cain to kill Abel? Oh, most certainly not. God let him know what his moral will was. God said, Cain, sin is crouched. Sin is like a, a, a lion or a tiger crouching out to devour you. But you need to make a change of mind here and master it. And Cain goes the opposite direction against the moral will of God, choosing instead uh, his, his path. Hosea 6.6 6 gives us another interesting statement because we as we look through the history and we see God's sovereign choice of Abraham as a nation and his sovereign choice of Israel as a people which is not changing God sovereignly chose to work with Israel the nation of Israel the Jews as his earthly people 
And he, said, uh, and he gave to them a wonderful system whereby they could maintain fellowship and life with the holy God. And it was the tabernacle and the sacrificial system that eventually became the, the sacrificial system used in the temple cult or the, the temple religion, right? God gave them that ability to pay for or to rather atone for, to cover over sin and to constantly point to and anticipate the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And yet, interestingly, here in Hosea 6.6, 6, so, so that we know that that was God's moral will, it was God's moral will that they would uh, constantly keep up the sacrificial system. When they'd sinned, when they'd failed, when they'd rebelled, they would come back and they would, you know, on the Day of Atonement, kill, kill the appropriate animals in the appropriate ceremonial way to remind them that they're looking forward to the Messiah. But then the Lord says something really interesting in Hosea 6.6. 6. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Well, that's interesting. Because God had made known to them his moral will. And his moral will was surely that they would continue to sacrifice and continue to give those burnt offerings, during, especially during the lifetime of Hosea. So he's not saying that, he only, or that he's you know, trying to abrogate his will earlier. He's saying, I just, that for sure, don't stop doing that, but there's something I want more. More than that, I want you to be merciful. To one another, show mercy. The word chesed is the idea of a loving kindness. I want you to be loving and kind and merciful one to another. And he says, I want you to have the knowledge of God more than the burnt offerings. So he's not here saying that he doesn't want them to do what he's commanded them to do in the Torah. In fact, he, he calls them back to that repeatedly throughout the Minor Prophets. But I love this verse just as an example of one of the times that God said, but I really want is your heart. What I really want is you to desire to know me. What I really want is you to live with a loving, gracious response that flows over into the lives of others. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I really want. It's bigger than just his moral will, isn't it? God's moral will is that every individual human would know him, would love him. And we see this again in uh, um, our reading today of Matthew 23, 37. I'll read it again for us. It says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, wait, you got to set context. I keep forgetting. I, I study and prepare for all this. You guys just come into it cold. So Jesus here is approaching Jerusalem. He's approach, approaching the city, coming up to the time of his passion, his death on the cross for sin. And here he is beholding Jerusalem, the chosen city, the holy city, the people, his earthly chosen people, and he's weeping. This is the moment of his triumph. This is the moment of his coming in. And he's weeping, and he says this, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That's a poetic repetition designed to show how much he loves them his emotional depth here oh jerusalem jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her how often i wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing see your house is left to you desolate for i say to you you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Christ had a moral will that he expected that Israel had the ability to keep. He said, I, I wanted to gather you. I longed to gather you. But you weren't willing. I wanted you to come. You were the one who said no. Again, God's primary moral will is to be in, in a loving, gracious relationship with his creatures. He can't be the one who's the problem, can he? It's absurdity. It's ridiculous. It's, it's laughable. But it shows us what it, at core it means to mind our own business. God's business God, that he wants you to mind, he's got for you, is to tend to Primarily, first and foremost, your relationship with him. He has done everything to make himself available to you and to me. 
we will choose. As an unbeliever, you choose whether you'll come to him or not. As a believer, you choose whether you will uh, pursue him and let him gather you just as he wanted to with Israel for those many years. 2 Peter 3.9 is another beautiful picture of the moral will of God. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. Slack here uh, means slow. He's not delayed. But long-suffering towards us, he's patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what is God's moral will? God's moral will is that all should come to what? To repentance, to a change of mind. He's not just wasting time. I know all of us at one time or another have looked up and said, Lord, today, it should be today. You should come back today. You should come back right now. And yesterday would have been fine, right? And when we wonder... Just for that moment, as you breathe that breath afterwards, that big sigh, you realize, (sighs) in the moment you sighed, 10 more were saved. In the moments you suffered, thousands more came to know the Lord and his salvation. In the moments we struggle, it is but one more moment for him to do his will upon this planet, and that's that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. But what do we see? Will all, will none perish? Will all come to repentance? We know, biblically speaking, that's not true. That the Lord's will, he stated his will, his desire, his moral will, but it's going to be sadly violated by tragic millions and maybe billions of souls. Not for a lack of his provision, but for a lack of our willingness to come, humanity's lack, uh, unwillingness to come, to know him as God and to glorify him. So we see here in this moral circle of God's will that it is God's stated will, it's what he wants to happen, but because he's given man free will after a fashion, I say after a fashion because God is autonomous, God is governed by no, nothing other than his own character. We, however, again, can only make the choices that God has given us to make. And the one choice that God has given every person to make is will you trust him for your salvation? It's the only choice that matters. And the choice that a Christian needs to make every day is, will I trust him today? Pretty simple to mind our own business when we understand what our business is. Romans 6.11 gives us a little bit more information about our business. This is something that you can do or something that you can choose not to do. So you can respond in obedience and faith, or you can respond and say, no, Lord, I've got this covered. But uh, after Romans 6, 1 through 10, wherein Paul has reiterated the reality that every person who trusts in Jesus Christ has thus been immersed or identified with him in his death and his burial and his resurrection and so is able to walk in newness of life, he says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin or to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So reckon yourselves, believe or count it down as a fact that you are dead unto the sin nature. You every day have a choice to either count yourself as alive to God and enlivened by God or been given life, regenerated by God, or uh, still slave, enslaved to your sin nature. What's the difference? The difference is whether you trust that what Jesus Christ did on that cross is in fact powerful and efficacious and if in fact what God's best for your life, God's will for your life is really the best. That's your choice. And choose to say, well, but what the world is offering here in, in this category or maybe you know that uh, <laughs> dishonest cane or, or that hurting someone for the the sense of power or revenge that it might give me whatever it is uh, we, we, we would reckon ourselves or think be thinking of ourselves as still alive to sin because the sin nature is still present we talked about that in a previous lesson but it is god's moral will that at every single moment you would be believing that what jesus christ did on the cross is powerful to continue to make you free from sin you never have to sin again another uh element if you like or another Feature It is God's will that everyone, we saw it's God's will that everyone trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. It's God's will that every single Christian believer walks in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We, we looked at this with some great depth in a previous lesson, so I'll refer you back there if you need a refresher. But the point of the matter is, is that you are meant to spend, this is God's will for your life. Guaranteed, no questions asked. Whatever other choice you make tomorrow or whatever other choice anyone makes, this is God's will for your life. 100%. 
100% guaranteed, this will never be the wrong answer, walk in the Spirit. That's it. If you walk by means of the Spirit, we talked about what that means and how one goes about that, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does God want me to do in this situation? He wants you to walk by means of the Spirit. He wants you to walk by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself up for you. That's always his will. Is it too simple? Maybe that's the problem. It's almost too simple to spend every moment just saying, and I'm going to choose to be preoccupied with Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 is a fun one because it actually has the word, This is the will of God! Your sanctification. Sanctification is to be set apart. This is the will of God that you would be, incre- be, be living out of the reality that you are set apart by him unto him. And then, by the way, what does that look like? One of the examples that he uses, the first one here, is that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, and, and then he goes on to talk about others. But all these sins, they're not... They're not a part of your sanctification. They're not a part of how you're sanctified through the work of Jesus Christ. This is the will of God, that you would live out of the spiritual reality that's been given to you in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4.5 But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions, sorry, afflictions do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry this is of course paul speaking directly to timothy we don't know that he was an evangelist by any stretch of the imagination i would say that it almost looks that he wasn't Um, but Paul is giving some very simple, clear uh, directions that I think are a part of God's or reflective of God's moral will for all of us. Be watchful. You know, t- 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 being watchful is interesting. It has the idea of paying attention. Again, with the endless parenting illustrations, but one of the things I feel like I'm saying all the time is just pay attention. You would not have spilled the milk if you were paying attention. You would not have fallen down if you were paying attention. Just pay attention. Are we spiritually attentive? That's God's moral will for you that you be awake. Because I don't know about you, I can watch hours of a movie or a television show or programming and advertisements that absolutely defy and spit in the face of the righteousness and holiness of God and afterwards go, I guess, yeah, I guess that wasn't the best. That's not attentive. Right? I'm not saying don't watch TV. I'm not saying don't watch movies. I'm just saying that we can be inattentive as we go about our lives and go about our days. We're meant to be attentive or watchful to him and his standards, his priority, and his words in all things at all times. Endure afflictions. It is always God's will. Oh, wait a minute. Does that mean it's God's will that you will be afflicted? It's 100% God's will that you will be afflicted. To quote the great film, the Princess Bride, life is pain, and anyone who says otherwise is selling something. And that's quite true. If you are expecting days without trials and tribulations and afflictions, you're in the wrong faith. Because Jesus told us in this world, you will, not might, will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. Why? Because he's overcome the world. But it's always God's will that you endure those afflictions as you're watchful, as you're in him. Do the work of an evangelist. This is why I actually put this verse in here. It is God's will, whether you're gifted as an evangelist or not, that every single believer be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news uh, that he loves us, that he gave his life for us. The good news that any single person can now be restored to a relationship with the God of the universe by the power of Christ's sacrifice. I love this, fulfill your ministry. Pleroma is the Greek word. It means to, to fill or to fill to overflowing. To overflow, right? Do you ever think of your life as, as being uh, something that you're overflowing? Ministry here means service. So you're overflowing. You're fulfilling your service. That's God's moral will. Whatever you're doing to use your spiritual gifts to see your ministry, your service in him, overflow. 
fill, uh, fill to fullness. So we've come a long way. Because when you answer these questions, you don't even have to answer many of the uh, individual wills type questions. That's what we're going to talk about in the next session, and that'll be loads of fun. But it's where everyone gets all hung up, and the reality is, is the most of the time, if we know God's moral will for our life, then we will not be distracted and have to worry too much about God's individual will for our life. What do I mean? You have two choices before you, whatever they are. So, you know, you've got two shirts before you to choose. Well, which shirt honors God the most? I, I, I used to use this illustration thinking of myself. I'd say, God doesn't care what shirt that you wear. And then I saw some of the shirts that some of the young girls were walking around in, and I realized there's a moral component. God does care what shirts some of us are wearing some of the time. So you would choose the shirt that is the most what? The most modest, the most godly, the most, uh, the most likely to give you the opportunity to, to glorify God in that choice. But it's not a question of praying, God, do I wear the crop top or the skimpy tee? Neither. You wear the sweaters. All the sweaters. Okay? I'm talking to you. Sweaters. What about the job? Oh, I don't know which job to take. Well, which one is going to put you in the best position to, to serve the Lord? If I take this job while we're working 90 hours a week and I pretty much won't make most services, then that job is probably not God's will for your life because it's God's will that you would be in fellowship and that you would grow. This job is going to keep me traveling and, and my family, you know, away from my family all the time. Now, I'm not making blanket statements. We all make decisions based on what we have to do. So I'm not trying to criticize your choices. But if it comes to the choice of being able to invest in your family and raise your children in the training and the admission of the Lord, that's God's moral will for you. So whatever you're going to do, you got to do that. Now, are there times where you have to make a choice to feed your family? That means you can't be with them as much? Absolutely that happens. But make sure it's for that reason. Not, well, because it made me a little more money. It was a little more fun. It was a little more up my alley. Are you going to choose which city to live in? Well, which city has a good church that you can be a part of? Which city is closer to your family so that you can be there for them when you care, when they need you? You can invest in their lives, right? All the individual will questions, all. Most of the individual will questions become pretty easily answered when you know what God's moral will is. When you understand how God designs all of us to live, we can say, well, if I'm going to go into that job and I'm not going to be able, it's going to struggle to walk in the, by means of the Spirit, or I go into this job and I'm going to somehow be gagged in my ability to share the gospel, I had this uh, tragic opportunity in my own life wherein I was working at a, at, a, at a car dealership that was largely above board and nice, but then I went to another place and realized that they thought of my dealership as being terribly dishonest. Well, then I went deeper and found out they were terribly dishonest and that I had no business sharing Christ with these people, sharing Christ's gospel with these people when ultimately they looked at me and they just saw the filth of the place that I was identified with. So we got out of that job. By God's grace, we were able to. When you know God's moral will, the other things will tend to pop into line. And that's the first question you need to be asking, not the third, because God's moral, God's moral will is never to steal the car. God's moral will is never to uh, make a God or worship money. God's moral will is never to on and on and on and on and on. So how can I know God's moral will? Well, we said it right at the beginning. It's the word of God. It means it's something you're growing in. That's why we're going to grow in our Christian walk to greater maturity, the greater ability to make good godly decisions and live a life that honors and pleases God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay. There's a lot in here which we will not have time to impact today, or, you know, unpack today. But the sense here is that Paul is going to totally repeat his advice in Romans 6. He says, I'm beseeching you, I'm asking you, I'm imploring you, I'm calling you alongside to do this with me. By the mercies, on the basis of God's mercy to you, that you 
present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that present? Just what Paul had said in Romans 6. You present your instruments, your bodies, not as um, slaves to sin, but as slaves to righteousness. So you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Every day, recognizing that your day, your body, your choices are the Lord's, or for His glory. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be, now here's where you get to our know the will of God part. And do not be conformed to this world. So, first, if you want to know the will of God, first off, you need to be positively aligned to him, recognizing that he's the one who saved us, and he is the one for whom that we're, we're living and responding in faith at every moment. Next, and it's just reasonable, and then it, we're not going to be conformed to this world. This world system and its leader, Satan, and its demonic presence is there constantly trying to conform us. That's outward pressure against a mold, trying to conform us to think like the world, to think like the enemy, to be deceived about what is important, about what is valuable, what is good and what is right. And that pressure is constantly coming. He says, do not let that pressure shape you, but instead <clears throat> be transformed. So the picture here is either you're going to be being, at any moment, conformed by this world, right? You imagine a, a mold and, and a piece of thin metal, sheet metal, just have constantly being barraged with pressure, whether that's hammer pelts or water or whatever it is, to try to change the shape and shape that metal around whatever that mold is. But the alternative is being, and the word here is where we get our English word metamorphosis, transformed internally, right? You're, you're familiar with the story of Arachne? Arachne was, uh, she thought herself as ancient Greek mythology, it's not true, but Arachne uh, thought she was really something special at, at weaving. She was the best weaver in the world, so she, tra she challenged, I believe it was Athena, the goddess of weavers, and um, so she beat her, which was, turned out was a bad idea because then... Uh, Athena turned her into the first spider. So she transformed internally. I always thought they should do, someone should, Hollywood should do this because I think it'd be great to like see the spider legs like growing out of her belly. It'd, just, it'd be very vivid in my mind. Maybe it's not in yours. But that's the picture. Instead of turning into a spider, as grotesque as that sounds or would be, we're being transformed internally changed. Internal to external, not external to internal by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? This. You take out that old worldly programming, that old worldly thinking, those worldly pressures and ideas, you reject them and replace them with this, the word of God. And I tell you, every page you turn and every day you grow, you'll find that the world had an even deeper impact on your thinking than you ever thought or ever would have imagined. And so as we are constantly renewed in our mind, constantly letting the word of God challenge our ideas about psychology, about philosophy, about relationships, about sex, about morality, about anything else that we can imagine, we're constantly letting the word of God be right and our own thinking be proved wrong and renewing our minds daily, then you're going to be able to test and approve what the acceptable and perfect will of God is. This can get mystical it's not mystical at all the more you let scripture dictate how you think the more you will think like god it's not magic it is the supernatural power of the holy spirit that is making it happen but it's not really that amazing to think that the more you know and humbly understand the word of god the more you'll able to be able to say in any situation yeah that's that's what that is so someone could come to me, just as a simple example, and say, I made April the very best jalapeno and habanero birthday cake of all time. I can't wait to give it to her on her birthday. Now, I've never asked April how she feels about jalapeno and habanero birthday cakes. But I know that she doesn't like spicy food. She doesn't like cake, particularly. She's more of a brownie person, is that right? Yeah, see? So I don't have to ask if she know, would like some habanero birthday cake. I know it. Why? Because I know her well enough to know that those things would not be amenable. Similarly, as you come to know God through his word, as you walk with him in faith, 
You'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, what God's moral will is. We're not talking, well, we're going to talk about God's individual will for your life next week, and it'll be just tons of fun. But right now, I want us to recognize that once we understand God's, that God's will is revealed in the Bible, we won't have nearly so many questions because the Bible reveals the attributes of God, what he's like, what he likes, what he cares for, what is good, what is positive, what is negative, what he forbids, what he wants. In the end, you will know God's will. And because you know God's will, you'll be able to live in confidence. Someone's going to come up screaming and say, you need to do this. And you go, no, I don't need to do that. You need to panic right now. I don't, don't actually need to panic right now. Why? Have you, I hope you're laughing because you notice it, right? Isn't, isn't it interesting how everything in this world seems to try to get you to panic? Ah, panic, you're going to die. Like, and? Like, <laughs> pull the other one. Like, I know I'm going to die. <laughs> I don't know when it'll be, and I don't particularly care that much. But you can sell a panicked person just about anything, right? If someone's panicked and scared, you can manipulate them and control them. Hey, just get on the train, whatever. Whether that's Satan, the enemy of our souls, or just the advertising man, the enemy of your wallet, we don't ever need to be panicked if we know God's will and as we live according to it. Knowing God's moral will is the key to living with confidence. This world's going to come and tell you you've got to do all sorts of things and say, I'll just stick with what God has for me to do. God's moral will and character are clearly written and revealed in the Bible. I'm not saying you wouldn't find an occasional, what we'll call an issue of conscience, where one believer says, I cannot do that, take part in that, eat that, drink that, go to that movie, whatever it is. But another one can. But interestingly, if we know God's moral will, then we'll know exactly what it is. Because if seeing that movie is going to take me further from Christ, I'll go, well, you might be able to see it. But I can't. I'd prefer not to, or I will not. Don't eat, don't drink, don't taste, don't touch. When we understand God's moral will, those decisions become really easy. And our final point, by studying God's word, we are able to discern God's moral will. So we're able to know God's sovereign will with probably the chief application of minding our own business and staying out of it. Knowing that he's got those things in hand. We're able to know God's moral will. These are the things of which we have been given uh, an element of control and be able to deal with that in our own lives and know that we'll stand before him saying, what I understood of what you revealed of yourself, that I tried to do. And finally, by studying God's word, We'll be able to discern God's moral will even in situations where we can't point to chapter and verse, but we can say, I, I don't have chapter and verse for why I don't want to do that, but it, it's going to draw me further from Christ. And that's it. So I hope that this slightly longer than planned message helps you walk with confidence in the coming days and weeks. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you and how we praise you for the tremendous gift of your word, of your Holy Spirit, of your revealed will. We thank you that you have revealed your sovereign will, set, decreed before ages of time by our God who is eternal, immortal, invisible, and all wise. We thank you for revealing your moral will, not just what you want us to do and not to do, but how you want us to relate to you. And Father, as we come to consider in, in our next study about your individual will for our lives, we praise you for all that you've revealed and shown us. And pray that we might respond in faith and thus live in confidence as we go through our days and weeks, months, and years. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.